Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. This time we're going to continue our reading of Henrietta's War by Joyce Dennis, news from the home front in Britain in World War II. July 3rd, 1940. My dear Robert, I picked up a paper this morning and read a cheery little article which said that if you are caught in an air raid while out on the street, the best thing to do is to throw yourself into the nearest doorway and lie on the ground with your feet toward the street and put a piece of India rubber between your teeth to prevent your eardrums from bursting. I read this in a detached sort of way and decided that I would carry a piece of India rubber about in my pocket in case of need. And then suddenly, the sheer incredibility of this war struck me, as it does all of us from time to time, like a blow. That we, with our electric light and wireless and technicolor films, should now have to throw ourselves into doorways with India rubber between our teeth seemed just too madly fantastic, as well as undignified. But now I'm talking about the war, and that is what I promised you I wouldn't do. So I will tell you about the dog, which has been evacuated upon Lady B. It is the size of a large rat, and has long silky hair covering it all over, so that it is not until you look closely at it and meet a bright knowing eye peering at you through the tangle that you know which end is which. Lady B, whose friend did not specify the breed in the telegram, announced the animal's ar before announcing the animal's arrival, had made up her mind it would be a Dalmatian, and was bitterly disappointed at first, but has now succumbed to the creature's undoubted charm. Its name is Fay, and though small, it is extremely fierce and autocratic, and drags Lady B about on a lead. The sight of them out together has cheered everybody up. Now, now, says Lady B, don't drag me over. Yesterday she wanted to go to the shops, and Fay wanted to go to the parade, where she puts it across big with all the local dogs. There was a long struggle, and I thought at one time that Lady B was going to be defeated, but she won in the end. This dog is a regular Hitler, said Lady B. She says now that she has Fay, she is no longer frightened of parachute troops, and has not slept with such a sense of security since her husband died. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. July 17, 1940. My dear Robert, However brave I try to be, and however carefully I forge myself armor to keep the bogies at bay, there are times when it seems to disintegrate, and I suddenly find myself exposed and defenseless and drowning in dark waters. I had one of those bouts on Wednesday, and I didn't enjoy it. I was walking on the cliff path, listening to the frightening noises our own soldiers make when Colonel Simpkins came up. Good morning, Henrietta. Have you got your gas mask? No. Have you got your identity card? No. In his special constable's uniform, Colonel Simpkins looked at me and sighed. Colonel Simpkins, I said, what exactly are the soldiers doing? Now there's no need for you to worry about that sort of thing, he said soothingly, patting me on the shoulder. Then, his field glasses trained on the horizon, he went on his way. Presently, Lady B and Mrs. Savernack came by and sat themselves down, one on each side of me. "'What's the matter, Henrietta?' said Mrs. Savernack. "'You look like a sick monkey.' "'I think,' I said, "'that the there-there-little-woman attitude "'adopted by the special constables "'does little to inspire confidence.' "'Damned old fool,' said Mrs. Savernack. "'I suppose they think we're afraid.' "'But I am afraid,' I said. "'Lady B and Mrs. Savernack turned blank faces toward me. "'Henrietta,' they said in shocked tones. "'Yes, I am,' I said stubbornly. I wasn't afraid yesterday, and I hope I shan't be afraid tomorrow, but today I am paralyzed with fear. What you want is a drink, said Lady B. Aren't you ever frightened, I said, looking at their round, placid faces with astonishment. Well, yes, of course I'm frightened, said Lady B. Nobody wants to be blown sky high, but not paralyzed with fear, I am glad to say. If they hadn't taken away my guns, I should be perfectly happy, said Mrs. Savernack angrily. From my bedroom window, I could easily have picked them off as they came up the beach, as easy as winking. It makes me sick. It really makes me sick. I was thinking today, said Lady B dreamily, that if all we useless old women lined up on the beach, each of us with a large stone in her hand, we might do a lot of real damage. The only time I saw you try to throw a stone, Julia, it went over your shoulder behind you, said Mrs. Savernack. Then I would have to stand with my back toward the Germans, said Lady B comfortably. 
Mrs. Savernack got up. Well, I must go, she said with a sigh. I'm due at the B, but it's dull work just turning the handle of a sewing machine when you'd like to be at a machine gun. What about you? What about that drink, Henrietta? said Lady B kindly, but I shook my head. You're too thin, said Mrs. Savernack, not for the first time. If you had some padding, your nerves would be better. I watched them walk away and reflected that Charles is probably right when he says that it was, is the old women of Britain who will break Hitler's heart in the end. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. July 24th, 1940. My dear Robert, our summer visitors are with us once more. We are resigned to them coming down every year and cluttering up the place, putting up the prices in the shops, parking their cars in front of our garden gates, keeping us awake at night with moonlight picnics on the beach, and wearing trousers when nature designed them for skirts. We have even schooled ourselves to withstand without flinching the patronizing attitude they adopt toward us, poor simple yokels that we are. Charles and I every summer even go so far as to play a game called insults. It is a simple pastime which amuses us and does the visitors no harm. Every time we are insulted by a visitor, separately insulted I mean, we score a point. Charles always wins, partly because he meets so many more people than I do, and partly because his profession exposes him to insults of the juiciest variety. They are continually saying to him, can you give me injections, or have you heard of a drug called M and B, and things like that. But somebody did once say to me, after I had recounted a modest anecdote, and how did you come to be having lunch at the Savoy Grill? It sometimes seems we can do nothing right. If we are cheerful, they say, of course you people don't realize down here there's a war on. If we show anxiety, they are moved to laughter and say that to hear us talk, one would think this was the one spot Hitler had his eye on. But last week, when the soldiery arrived and began their activities, a good many of them packed their boxes and went away again. Not all, because some of them have taken furnished houses for the duration, and the relentless march of time is already beginning to change them from visitors into residents. Only yesterday, I heard one of them say angrily, really, all these strangers make shopping impossible. The soldiery continues its activities, and pillboxes spring up all around us like mushrooms. Writing one's name and a little Hitler abuse in the concrete before it is dry has provided many of us with a lot of quiet fun. And Perry shows just what he thinks of the Nazi regime every time he passes them. Lady B's house is now completely surrounded by impedimentia. I met her yesterday struggling up the hill with her shopping basket. Look, she cried, waving her hands toward a mass of barbed wire and concrete. I never thought I'd be in the front line. I'm so proud. I have been pasting strips of linen on the windows, an absorbing occupation and one that I recommend to anybody who feels an attack of the jitters coming on. First, you make some paste according to BBC instructions. That in itself induces a feeling of smug satisfaction, and tearing up material and pasting it crosswise on the panes of glass completes the good work. After putting pale blue on the bathroom window, I was so flushed with success I started hunting all over the house for pieces of material which would tone in with the color schemes. Yellow in the kitchen, green in my bedroom, pink in the linnets, it was all too fascinating and the results exceeded my wildest dreams. Faith, who dropped in during the afternoon and had already done her own windows expensively with adhesive tape, stood transfixed. I really can't compete with that, my dear Henrietta, she said enviously. But she did, because she went home and did the whole house with lingerie silk and pastel colors, each strip coming from a half circle in the corner like the rays of the setting sun. People go miles to see it. It was the duck's egg blue for the dining room which stumped me finally. I searched the house for something suitable and was a long time before I found it. Charles was sitting down to dinner that evening, looked toward the windows, and suddenly stiffened with dismay. Oh, Henrietta, he said reproachfully, my nicest pajamas. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. July 31st, 1940. My dear Robert, 
We are all thankful when Faith gave up her job in London and came back here to be an ARP warden, partly because we felt that running out into the streets and collecting stray animals during an air raid was not suitable work for her, and partly because the conductor, whose passion seemed to continue in one long crescendo, made our lives a burden during her absence with his yearnings and lamentations. Even Lady B and I, who are devoted to him, took to hiding behind the counters in shops when we saw him coming and putting large not-at-home notices on our doors whenever we were alone in our houses. Not that that kept him away, for he used to stand outside looking wistfully in at the windows until for very shame we invited him in. I knitted nearly a whole balaclava helmet while he opened his heart to me, and Lady B said his voice was so soothing she found it almost impossible to keep her eyes open, and slept solidly through most of his visits. One evening, when Charles had been called out to a case, I felt so sure of an impending conductor visit, and so unable to cope with him, that I crept quietly up to bed at nine o'clock. I had hardly settled myself comfortably with my book, when there was a timid knock, and the conductor's face, with a distraught expression on it, peered round the door. "'You don't mind if I come in, do you, Henrietta?' he said hoarsely, and without waiting for an answer, he seated himself at the foot of my bed, and began. "'I don't bore you, do I?' he said about half an hour later, and I opened my eyes with a start. Lady B had been quite right about the soothing quality of his voice. What a good plan it would be, I thought sleepily, if the conductor could be employed as a conducer of sleep. Charles, I knew, had many patients who lay awake worrying about the war, and the conductor was continually complaining that Faith didn't love him because his weak chest prevented him from doing useful war work. Well then, well then. The next thing I remembered was the conductor's voice still tolling like a beautiful bell, and Charles in his pajamas standing in the door of his dressing room. Hello, he said mildly. What's going on here? It's Faith, I said sleepily. She doesn't love him. Tell me about it, said Charles kindly but unwisely as he clambered into bed. You see, it's like this, Charles, said the conductor, getting off the end of my bed and transferring himself to the end of Charles's and beginning all over again. In the morning, when we woke, he had gone. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. August 7th, 1940. My dear Robert, ever since the soldieries arrived in this town, a patriotic fervor has been sweeping it like a prairie fire, and everybody is getting an immense amount of fun out of it. The Admiral appealed through a loudspeaker in the street on Saturday night for people to go and dig trenches, and there was a fine response on Sunday afternoon and a still finer crowd to watch the fun. The big moment was when Mrs. Savernack arrived in shorts and leaping into the trenches began to wield her pick with such fury that the people on either side of her moved quietly away. It warmed our hearts to see her, for she has been sadly out of sorts ever since they took away her guns and refused her for the LDV. But it was the aluminum appeal which finally restored her to her old form. As soon as she heard it, she rushed and borrowed a handcart from the Boy Scouts, and never, except possibly during the days of the Great Plague and its grisly cry of, bring out your dead, have people dreaded a house-to-house -house collection more. Rat-a-tat goes the door knocker, worked with gusto by Mrs. Savernack's strong right arm. Rat-a-tat, and the housewife, after peering through the curtains, runs with a smothered cry to hide her new three-decker steamer under the bed in the spare room. Is anybody at home? shouts Mrs. Savernack, opening the back door, and unless she gets an immediate answer, she walks in and finds her way to the kitchen. You don't want this, she says firmly, taking a saucepan out of the cupboard. I do, I do, cries the housewife, wringing her hands. It's what I make coffee in. You should make it in a jug, said Mrs. Savernack, and retires with her prey. Everybody has given willingly and generously, but that is not enough for Mrs. Savernack, who holds the opinion that any woman with an aluminum utensil in her house is a fifth columnist. After a few days, her collection became so enormous she had to hire an empty shed to house her spoils, and fixed on me to guard them during her absence. I agreed, for it is better to give in to Mrs. Savernack at once, 
and now I spend most of the day sitting in the aluminum depot worrying about the things I ought to be doing in my own house. Did I tell you, Robert, that I'm beginning to know the difference between the noise our aeroplanes make and that of our enemy? Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. August 14, 1940. My dear Robert, do you remember Barton's bell? It is the old ship's bell which used to ring at regular intervals during the day for the workmen to knock on and knock off their work. Its sonorous and mellow tones were very dear to us all, and when they stopped ringing it at the beginning of the war, our lives immediately became horribly disorganized. Nobody ever knows quite what the time is now, and a lot of people who had managed quite comfortably up till then have been forced to buy watches. Charles says the general public nowadays is far too ready to use expressions such as subconscious, inferiority complex, and escape neurosis without understanding their meaning. But the only way I can think of to describe what happened when Barton's bell began ringing the other afternoon is to say that it took several minutes for the sound to penetrate from our subconscious to our conscious minds. I was doing a little ironing at the time and looked at my watch to see if it was right for six o'clock and found it was half past four. Then it suddenly dawned on me that I hadn't heard the bell for about nine months. Parachutes, I cried, and rushing out on the roof expecting to see the sky full of white mushrooms with gentlemen in pale blue overalls dangling from them. It was empty. Then, for one ecstatic moment, I thought the war was over, for Barton's bell was rung hilariously in November 1918. But on second thoughts, I decided that this was just wishful thinking, and that reminded me of Charles, for wishful thinking is another of the expressions which irritate him on the lips of the ignorant. So I rang him up in his surgery and asked why Barton's bell was ringing. I don't know, I'm sure, said Car Charles rather crossly, and rang off. Determined not to miss any excitement which might be going, I hurried down to the end of the garden and looked over the wall just in time to see the fire brigade go by. After it came a crowd of people. Everybody who had a uniform, an armlet, or a badge seemed to have put it on and was surging along the road with a do-or-die expression on his or her face. The home guard was there, carrying rifles and looking happy. VADs, ARPs, WVSs, AFSs, and a sprinkling of girl guides, boy scouts, and St. John ambulance workers. The transport drivers were grinding along one behind the other in bottom gear. What's happening? I shouted over the wall. We don't know, they shouted back. Is it an invasion, Admir Admiral Marsden, I said, for I felt he would know if anybody did, but he only looked mysterious and put his finger to his lips. Faith, lovely in her siren suit, was walking hand in hand with the conductor. They looked too happy to be much use to anyone. I couldn't see Lady B anywhere, but Mrs. Savernack, wearing Mr. Savernack's 1915 tin hat, was marching with the home guard. She'd got hold of some sort of blunderbuss and was carrying herself proudly. The home guard looked a little uncomfortable, but none of them liked to tell her to go away. I watched this cavalcade out of sight and was resting, reflecting wistfully that I seemed to be the only person without a badge or uniform when Lady B came trotting round the corner looking unusual in VAD uniform, her head tied up in a towel. I was having a perm, she panted, when the bell started, and Madame Yvonne said, I'm afraid that is the signal for invasion, madam, but don't be frightened. I'm not frightened, I said, but get me out of this or I shall miss all the fun. The last person to arrive was Colonel Simpkins, in a state of exhaustion. He had been caught inspecting the defenses on the beach, the wrong side of the barbed wire, and had run a mile along the pebbles before he could get back to the parade. In the end, it turned out to be the railway embankment on fire, and the fire brigade, with speed and efficiency, dammed the brook and put it out. The owners of the house nearby, who, fearing for their thatched roof, had not unnaturally rung up for the fire brigade, looked a little dazed when they saw about 200 people and seven motor cars pressed into the lane outside their house. It was the sparks we were afraid of, they said apologetically to the silent crowd at the gate. Perhaps next time it will be the real thing. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. And we'll hear more from Henrietta next time.